Barack Obama or Mitt Romney? Neither. Which of these two should a Christian vote for on November 6th? Now, I'll tell you right up front, this is not a bait and switch. So I'm not going to tell you the name of a particular candidate <clears throat> that you're going to vote for, or you should vote for, <clears throat> or some sort of third party candidate that you should express interest in. That's not what I'm going to do in this sermon. So I just want to be clear up front. There will not be a specific name that I will be giving to you, encouraging you to vote for that person. Nor is this sermon ultimately going to be about politics, or I should say, primarily about politics. However, I do not think it's an accident that as America is coming to this time in which we will be choosing a leader, that we happen to be in the book of 1 Samuel when the nation of Israel is coming to a point where they'll be choosing a leader for themselves. And looking at that this week and praying through that, I couldn't help but think God wants for us to talk together about choosing leaders. And so this morning I am going to give you a passage of scripture that I'm hoping you will think through and pray through as we look to vote on November 6th. But what it is that I think God has to say to us in the book of 1 Samuel is much larger than what's going on in the political realm and affects every area of our life. So if you would, take your Bible and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. If you need a Bible, there's one in the rack in front of you or underneath your seat. It's page 195 in those Bibles. 1 Samuel chapter 8. If you're following along and reading uh, at home with your family or in your small group or as an individual, this morning we're going to cover 1 Samuel 8 and 1 Samuel 12. These are bookends of the same event. 1 Samuel 8 is the prelude. 1 Samuel 12 is the postlude. The event itself, the choosing of a king, is 1 Samuel 9 through 11. We're going to look at that next week. But this week we're tackling 1 Samuel 8 and 1 Samuel 12 together. And we jump in in verse number 4. 1 Samuel 8, verse number 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now stop there for a moment. Question. Is it wrong for Israel to have a king? No. Is it wrong for Israel to ask for a king? This passage doesn't seem all that positive about this. Okay, this doesn't seem like this is a good event, does it? God doesn't seem to be happy with what's going on here. But the question is, what about David? David's going to be king of Israel. Is God going to be against his kingship? No. No. Doesn't Israel need a king so that when Jesus comes along, he can fill that role as king, not only of the universe, but also of Israel? What's going on here? Well, maybe you're saying, well, obviously there's something negative happening in this passage. But it can't just be the idea of a king. Maybe it's the fact that they're saying, we want a king like all the other nations around us. Maybe that's the problem. Well, that's part of it, but I don't think that's the whole story. Turn back, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17. Deuteronomy, you're going to turn back towards the beginning of your Bible. 
Deuteronomy chapter 17, page 138. <clears throat> We're going to look at a portion of scripture that was written hundreds of years before 1 Samuel 8 was written. This is enshrined in the Mosaic law. This is part of the revelation that God gave to the nation of Israel through Moses. <clears throat> Notice what Deuteronomy 17 verse 14 says. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it. That's where the nation of Israel is in 1 Samuel 8. They've taken possession of the land. They're settling into the land. That's their situation exactly. Look what it says. And you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. That's the exact wording from 1 Samuel chapter 8. And here in Deuteronomy 17, this doesn't seem to be a bad thing. God seems to be sanctioning it by writing it into the Mosaic law. He's saying, look, I know there's going to come a time when you're going to ask for a king. And instead of telling them don't do that, he says, let me give you some instructions on how to choose a king. And here in Deuteronomy 17 are the instructions on how to choose a king. Now I told you at the beginning of the sermon I was going to give you a passage of scripture that we should think through and pray through as we think about this presidential election coming up November 6. This is that passage. Listen as I read through what God has to say to the nation of Israel about choosing a king. Now before I do, America is not Israel. We do not have the same promises made to us that God made to Israel. When I read this passage, this is not speaking to our situation exactly. However, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for us today. And what God has to say in Deuteronomy 17 is relevant, especially by analogy. We are choosing a leader. These are instructions to Israel about them choosing a leader. Let's see what God has to say. We begin in verse 15. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He goes on to describe what that king must be like. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. Now, he's not really focused here on brother or foreigner from an ethnicity point of view, but from a religious point of view. He's saying, don't have a king over you who's not a follower of Yahweh, who's not a follower of the God of the Bible. The king, verse 16, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself, or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Stop right there for a moment. In this first paragraph, God is saying what Israel should look for in a king is first and foremost that person must be a genuine believer in the God of the Bible. He must be a follower of Yahweh. Moreover, that person must not have an overly strong fondness for weapons, women, or wealth. That if you have such a king who has great weapons, lots of wives, and lots of wealth, those three things will take his heart far from God. So for today, we would say ideally, a candidate for president should be a Christian, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and walking in close fellowship with him. But the requirements continue. Verse 18. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the priests who are Levites. 
It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. Now look at this. And not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. This second paragraph, God says that ideally the leader, the king of Israel, must be a person who adheres to God's moral law. He must not think himself too smart for the law. He's not supposed to reinterpret God's moral law to fit with the culture that he finds himself in. So for today, we would say according to Deuteronomy 17 in this second paragraph, that the ideal candidate for president would be somebody who follows in close obedience God's moral law and does not seek to reinterpret it according to the whims and fancies of the culture around us. Now, if these are the two major requirements, that a person must be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and walking closely with him, and that person must not reinterpret God's moral law so that disobedience is said to be okay, then frankly speaking, neither one of the candidates that are on offer today is an ideal candidate. Neither one of these candidates meets what God has in mind when he thinks of an ideal candidate. Here it is in the scriptures. He's written it for us. And as I look at this, and I try to understand what's going on today in light of what God has written here, I have to come to the conclusion for me personally that neither one of these candidates is an ideal candidate according to what God would want. Amen. So the question is, what, what are we supposed to do? What are you supposed to do if neither candidate is an ideal candidate? Well, first of all, what I think we're supposed to do is default to the very first part of this verse. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. Which means in our situation, pray like crazy that God would be the one who does the selecting because when it's confusing to us, I'd rather leave it up to him. Amen. And then on November 6th, Vote the way the Spirit prompts you to vote. Amen. Pray like crazy, listen for God's voice, and then vote in accordance with the way the Spirit leads you. That's the first thing you and I ought to do when faced with a situation where there is no ideal candidate. But the second thing that we ought to do, which is more important, is realize that the fact that there is no ideal candidate that that is a sign from the Lord that politics are not the solution to the problem. Amen. That if this was the means by which God was going to bring about real change, wouldn't he have to offer us a candidate that fits with what he really wants? And if there is no ideal candidate, if there is no candidate who lives up to the standards spelled out in Deuteronomy 17, the more important point is to realize that this cannot be the way that God wants to bring his kingdom into this world. With that in mind, turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 8. We jump back into our story. 1 Samuel chapter 8, we're at verse number 9. Now listen to them, God says to Samuel, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Verse 10, Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. They will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest. 
and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. Stop right there. The first warning God gives to Israel is he says, beware. A king will take your children and your money to accomplish militarily what he wants to accomplish. For those of you reading between the lines, what that means is God is saying, beware. A president will take people and resources from us to accomplish militarily what he wants to accomplish in the world. God says this is a warning, but that's only half the warning. Keep reading. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys, he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. Stop right there for a moment. For those of you reading between the lines, God is saying, beware. A president will tax you to pay for his plans and his programs. Two warnings in 1 Samuel. Warnings against a leader who wants to lead you into military conflict because it will cost you your money and your children. And a warning against leaders who want to tax you to pay for their plans and their programs. Notice how God concludes this, verse 18. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. Now, hearing this warning from God, why in the world would Israel want a king? God says, look, let me be frank with you. Let me tell you exactly what it is you're going to get. You're going to get somebody who's going to take your kids and your money to go to war and to build his plans and his programs. Why in the world would Israel want a king? Well, this gets to the heart of the problem as to why God was upset that they asked for one in the first place. Deuteronomy 17 sanctions kingship in Israel. There's nothing wrong with the Israelites asking for a king just like all the other nations around them have. That's the exact language from Deuteronomy 17. But it's clear they've done something wrong. But as with everything in First and Second Samuel, figuring out what they've done wrong is not on the surface level. You must look into their hearts. And verses 19 and 20 give us a peek into the hearts of of the Israelites. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us, then we will be like all the other nations. And here's where they go beyond what it says in Deuteronomy 17. And here's where we find the key phrase that reveals what's actually going on in their hearts. With a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. See what 1 Samuel 8 doesn't tell us, but what 1 Samuel 12 makes clear is Israel has an enemy bearing down on them at this moment. Look on the screen up here as I show you what chapter 12, verse 12 says. <clears throat> Samuel says, but when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, no, we want a king to rule over us even though the Lord your God was your king. The problem was, is in 1 Samuel 8, there is another enemy who's bearing down on them. And the people are saying to themselves, we want a king to go out and fight our battle for us. We want him to lead us into battle. Now what's wrong with that? Well, you can only see what's wrong with that if you compare it to the statement that's made about David who is a king after God's own heart. Listen to what's said about David in 1 Samuel 25, 28. For the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my master. That's for David. Because he fights what? 
the Lord's battles. Do you see the difference? In 1 Samuel 8, the Israelites want somebody who will fight their battles for them. What makes David such a great king is that he's there to fight the Lord's battles. You see, we looked last week in 1 Samuel 4 to 7 about Israel's problem is they wanted to manipulate God. They wanted to go to war with the Philistines and God hadn't sanctioned that war. So they thought, well, we'll just bring the Ark of the Covenant along and then God will be forced to do what we've dragged him into doing. But they learn you cannot manipulate God. But look what happens in 1 Samuel 8. They've just changed tactics slightly. Okay, we can't manipulate God. But if we have a king, we can manipulate him. Then he will be forced to fight our battles for us. He will be forced to lead us into battle. See, the Israelites are not doing what they did in 1 Samuel 7, which was praying and waiting for God. They don't like waiting for God. They think, well, we can't make God do what we want him to do, but if we've got a king, we can make him do what we want him to do. And that's the problem with what's going on in their heart. They think that the king is there to serve them, their needs, their interests, their desires. God's trying to warn them. You think you're going to be able to manipulate a king easier than you're going to be able to manipulate me. But the problem is, is once that king gets into that position of leadership, it's not going to be you controlling him. It's going to be him controlling you. The same is true for us today. If we think our leaders are here to serve our needs and our interests and fight our battles for us, then we've made the same mistake the Israelites have made. And our desire for this leader or for that leader is actually a reflection of our desire to want to control things so it turns out the way we want them to turn out. We think if I can get that guy elected, he will do what I want done. If I can get this person elected, they will put in place the plans and the programs that are in my best interest. It's the exact same thing that Israel was trying to do. God's saying what you don't understand is that after that leader is put in place, you do not control him. He exercises control over you. That's why at the end of the day, it's not really about us being able to control what's going on. This leads to the larger point. Remember I said that the sermon is about politics, but it's not ultimately about politics. It's about something bigger. And the bigger thing is seen in the next two verses, verses 21 and 22. These are two of the scariest verses in the Bible. Listen to what they say. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. And here comes one of the scariest verses you're ever going to read. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. The reason this is a scary verse is because the broader principle is be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you ask God for. He might just ultimately give it to you. You see, sometimes we get from the Lord what we're asking from for the Lord, not because his favor is upon us, but because of our obstinacy and our stubbornness and because we keep demanding from the Lord that he do what we want him to do. And sometimes one of the scariest things that can happen is God says, okay, you really want this king? I warned you. But here it comes. This applies to politics. We beg God and we ask God for a specific candidate because we think if we could get that candidate into office, that candidate will do what we want him to do. We'll be able to control what he does and we'll get the things that we want. And sometimes God says, okay, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you ask God for. 
You know, I hear every four years the same thing. This is the most important election in recent history. (laughs) Do you not hear that every four years? And every four years, no matter who's elected, the exact same thing happens, whether it's one month or one year or four years later. Disappointment. Disappointment. We get what we ask for. Sometimes it's the candidate we prayed for. Sometimes it was a different candidate. It doesn't matter which one it is. At the end of the day, it's disappointment. That's what God's saying. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you ask for. Because God just may give it to us. That's why Deuteronomy 17 says, pick the candidate God tells you to choose not the candidate that you in your mind have decided will serve your interests or this country's interests best but this applies to so much more than just politics if you're here this morning asking God repeatedly for a spouse because you think in your mind if I just had a spouse Then my life would go a different direction. Then I would be able to control what was going on in my life. Then the loneliness that I'm experiencing, the things that I'm going through, all of that would go away if I just had a spouse to take care of things. And in reality, marriage is a good thing. God created the institution of marriage just like God sanctioned kingship in in, in Israel. But the problem is, is that when Israel thought of a king as someone who was there to serve their needs and help them accomplish what they wanted to accomplish, instead of thinking this as a person who can accomplish what God wants accomplished, when we think about a spouse as a person who's there to serve us, who's there to solve our problems, who's there to make everything better for us, to make our life full of meaning, God says, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you constantly, stubbornly ask God to give you. Marriage is a good thing. Marriage for the wrong reasons is a bad thing. And it's possible. God is saying, look, if I give you what you think is going to make you happy, who you're rejecting is not any person, it's me. God's saying, I'm your spouse. I'm the one who brings you comfort. I'm the one who walks with you. I'm the one who is your friend. And when we say back to God, no, I want a spouse like all the other families around me. I want a spouse that's going to meet my needs. God's saying, be careful what you wish for because you may end up with a spouse and still have all the loneliness issues, still have all the trouble, and now have a spouse on top of it. Same thing is true when it comes to money. Money's not bad. God sanctions the use of money just like he sanctions marriage, just like he sanctions kingship in Israel. There are some people to whom God has given a lot of money. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a blessing from the Lord. But you and I, we sometimes think if I could just have more money, then I could get out of this miserable house or get out of this miserable job or get out of this neighbor or get out of this situation. What we're thinking to ourselves is God's not going to rescue me, but if I had money, I could rescue myself. God's saying, but I'm your deliverer. I'm the one who always shows up. Have I ever not been there for you? And what we say back to God is, is but you're not here when I tell you to be here. You don't do it the way I want it done. And what we're really saying to God when we're constantly asking him for more money is we're rejecting him as our king and saying, I know better. I can make my life better than the way you're running this. Same is true for power, for beauty, for athletic success, for whatever it may be. We get in our minds this idea that if I could be in control, if I could run my life, it would go a lot better. And we ask God for something that will allow us to exercise control in our life, whether it's a spouse, whether it's money, whether it's a certain candidate, whether it's athletic success, whatever it may be, we think to ourselves, if I could just have that, then I could make all these problems go away. And God's saying all of that 
is a rejection of me as your king and your Lord. It's a rejection of me as your husband, as your provider. First Samuel 8 is about some much bigger than politics. It's about who do we look to in the times of trouble? Do we look to ourself? Do we try to get everything in life to serve us? Do we try to put things in our life that we can use to accomplish what we want? Do we try to find people who will fight our battles for us? Or do we resolve to be the kind of people who fight the Lord's battles, wherever they may be? Now what's the end of the situation? What do you do if you're here and you're in a marriage that perhaps you begged God for, but with the wrong motives in mind? And that you found yourself in a difficult situation, a difficult marriage? What if you're here and you've been begging God for money for years and years and years and he finally gave in and gave it to you and now you find yourself not controlling money but being controlled by the money instead? What if on November 7th, the candidate we begged God for or you begged God for ends up being elected and on November 7th or June 7th or whenever it is, we're faced with that same disappointment. Things didn't work out the way I thought they were going to work out. What are we supposed to do at that point? Turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 12 for the conclusion of the matter. In the intervening chapters, God does give Israel their king. The postlude to the event is 1 Samuel 12, where Samuel confronts Israel with their sin in asking for a king. We jump in at verse 19. The people all said to Samuel, pray to the Lord your God for your servants so that we will not die. For we have added to all our other sins the evil of asking for a king. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil. Yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn after useless idols like politics or spouses or money or power or beauty. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will be swept away. What God is saying is it doesn't matter what situation that you are in, nor even how you got there. If you're in the middle of a marriage that you got married for the wrong reasons, if you're in the middle of a financial situation and you're there for the wrong reasons, if we end up in a, and as a country in the middle of a political situation for the wrong reasons, Samuel says, don't be afraid. The answer is having an undivided heart towards God. If at this point, at this moment, regardless of mistakes made in the past, you and I turn away from these idols, turn away from the politics and from the money and from thinking that certain relationships will solve our problems, we turn away from these things and back to God, everything's going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. And if you're here this morning and you're pursuing a spouse urgently, earnestly, because you think that spouse is going to solve all of your problems. Samuel's saying, stop, stop pursuing that spouse and pursue God instead. If you're here this morning and you're pursuing money at all costs because you are sure that that money is going to fix those things, God is saying, stop pursuing money and pursue me instead. If you're here this morning and you're pursuing a particular candidate to be elected with all your heart, God's saying, stop pursuing that candidate and pursue me instead. Yes, vote on November 6th. Vote the way the Spirit leads you to vote but at the end of the day turn your attention to God and no matter what happens on November 6th if we obey and seek the Lord with all our heart we will be just fine if we disobey and chase after worthless idols we will be in bad shape no matter who's elected no matter who we're married to no matter how much money we have 
At the end of the day, the conclusion of the matter is this. Serve God with an undivided heart. Fear him alone. Don't seek after the rest of this stuff. The Lord knows that we need these things. He provides them for us. He's in control. Anything else we could give our attention to would only end up ruling over us. When we commit ourselves to the Lord who is kind and compassionate and good. Samuel says it doesn't matter the mistakes that were made in the past. From this point on, choose this day whom you will serve. Joshua says, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So if you're here in a situation and you think, I'm not sure I made the right choices to get here. I'm not sure I didn't talk God into this thing. I'm not sure if I didn't beg God for this thing and this hasn't turned out the way I thought it was going to turn out. Samuel says, don't be afraid. Pursue God with all your heart and no matter what the situation, it will turn out to be a blessing. Let's pray together. Amen. <clears throat> Lord, we confess before you that we are an idolatrous people. We didn't think we were idolatrous before we came here because we haven't carved any statues out of wood and bowed down to them. But Lord, your word speaks to our hearts today and tells us that we have been following after idols. God, I admit we listened to news and in the, in the past months, the phone calls and the news media and the debates and the advertisements and everything about politics causes our hearts to be drawn towards that and think if we could just have this happen everything would be okay lord we confess to you that's an idol god in our own lives whether it's fame or money or relationships or whatever god we've we've run after everything else except you forgive us lord help us to turn our focus back to you God, you're so good to us. You're so kind to us. You remind us, go back and think about all the things you've done for us. God, as a church, as a nation, as a people, you've done so much for us. Why would we ever doubt you now? Lord, help us to get our focus off the rest of this stuff and back on you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.